Mr. Chairman, Your Excellency, the African Ambassador to Argentina, ladies and gentlemen. Let me begin by expressing my thanks to Dr. Alberto Rodriguez Javarini, President of CARI, as well to the Excellency, the African Ambassador to Argentina, who have given me this opportunity to open the discussion on the present situation in Africa with an emphasis on economic and financial issues. In doing so, I will try to describe what Africa, in my view, is today and how it came to where it stands at present before addressing its perspectives and closing by a few words on the relationship between Africa and Latin America and between my own country, Morocco, and the rest of the African continent, as well as with Latin America. Africa is indeed a big, fascinating continent. It is also a mosaic of peoples, ethnicities, languages, and religions. It has a young population of more than one billion people and is uniquely endowed with huge natural resources including oil and most of the minerals. Its 2013 GDP is around $2,300 billion, representing 3% of the world's GDP. <coughs> Northern Africa, Nigeria, and South Africa represent close to 70% of the continent GDP, so seven countries make 70% of, of Africa's uh, GDP. Africa, it's uh, 70%. It is to be noted that African GDP is probably underestimated because of the big size of the informal sector yeah. and due to deficiencies in statistics, as demonstrated recently in the Nigerian case, where the GDP was revalued uh, to uh, much higher uh, and making of Nigeria the first country now in terms of GDP in, in the continent. Africa's share in world trade is also 3%. It, it used to be 5% in 1980. It lost, so Africa lost somehow between those two dates its share of world trade, while intra-African trade is only 10%, which is very low compared to the situation in other continents, especially Asia and also Latin America. While these figures seem low, they do not reflect the positive evolution of the continent and the continuous interest of the international community in it. It is true that the continent, after regaining its independence in the late 50s and early 60s, when three, almost three lost decades in terms of development, misguided policies heavily centered on demand without the resources to back them, and absence of productive investment led to deep crises and loss of confidence in the continent, which was seen as growing only during the short periods of commodity price booms, as happened in the mid-70s. To give you an idea, for example, of, of this uh, lag that developed at that time, in 1960, the GDP per capita of Ghana and Morocco was equal to that of Singapore and Thailand uh, and, uh, and Korea. All of them were at hundred dollars per capita income. You have seen now the differences that developed uh, since that time. Although this has started to change in the mid-90s and more clearly in the early 2000s when GDP growth registered increases averaging almost continuously 5% except in 2009 when the world financial crisis hit. This was accompanied by increases of 2-3% in per capita income. Large fiscal deficits which were widespread have improved until 2009, but turned to negative, generally on account of investments, whose rate hovers around 23-24% of GDP, while gross national savings stand around 20%. The external accounts are consequently negative, but remain manageable. Government debts 
after the implementation of the, the two HIP initiatives and the scheduling remain also with a few exceptions manager. Foreign India Direct Investment has picked up, representing 2-3% of GDP, 2-3% of GDP, and foreign reserve averaged 4 to 5 months of imports of goods and services. Terms of trade have improved and exchange rates are generally more consistent with market conditions. All these developments presented in averages mask, of course, diverse situations between, for example, oil and non-oil countries, middle income and high <coughs> countries, and do not do justice to the issue of distribution of wealth, which is seriously affecting our continent. Mr. Chairman, I, after this uh, overview, I believe it's interesting to look at how Africa succeeded in registering this remarkable turnaround. First of all, most African countries, with the support of the international community, undertook during the 80s and part of the 90s a heavy regimen of adjustment, which, with a few exceptions, helped them redress, as we have seen, their macroeconomic indicators. It is also to be noted that initially this was mostly limited to the so-called first generation of reforms. Later, other issues, like those related to governance, development of the private sector, and financial systems, have been addressed with diverse results. African countries are also addressing and giving priority to the issue of poverty. As we all know, the proportion of population living in poverty in Africa is the highest in the world in proportion, uh, because uh, the yes. in Asia is uh, the number of much higher. But in proportion, Africa is the highest. The continent has had bad indicators in terms of education, health, access to water, sanitation, life expectancy, women equality, environment, etc. Also topping the agenda is the high unemployment rate, especially of the youth, including the educated among them. Governments are trying very hard to address these issues and working on the attainment of the Millennium Development Goals, aiming at cutting by half the poverty rate by 2015. It is unfortunate to note that with the exception of Northern Africa, South Africa and few other countries, most of African countries will not on present trends reach this goal. To be sure, some of them will reach some of the targets that we miss others. Mr. Chairman, another contributing factor to the improvement in Africa's situation is the notable abatement in the number of conflicts. At some point in the past, these conflicts numbered 16. They have come down now to fewer numbers, still, it's, uh, it's uh, still an issue. Other factors have to do with the emergence of a strong civil society, which is vocal and active on issues that were dealt with before solely by governments as well as on economic and social activity. Moreover, the technological revolution, particularly with the introduction of the mobile phone and the internet, has clearly allowed a leapfrogging in terms of development. Lastly, migrant transfers and tourism receipts also play a positive role in a big number of countries. Mr. Chairman, the turnaround in Africa's economic condition was also due to the greater involvement of the international community. Although its interventions fall short of expectations, the G8 commitments are stagnating at around $120 billion and are even on decreasing trend in terms of ODA. More importantly, with the exception of few countries, we are very far from the 0.7% of GDP agreed at the UN. More progress was achieved on debt reduction thanks to three debt initiatives which reduced sizably the official debts of many sub-Saharan African countries. The interesting point in this operation is that the related released resources were to be used in the fight against poverty, particularly in the education and health sectors. It is on trade that the least progress was made. 
However, after agreeing in Doha on the link to be made between trade and development, the negotiations stalled since then. This being said, some African countries benefit from preferences granted by the AU, as well as from the US AGOA initiative, which is to be supposed to be renewed next year. Last but not least, the cooperation with the BRICS countries and more largely emerging countries, particularly China, has played a major role in the promotion of trade and investment in the continent. Mr. Chairman, starting from this relatively comfortable situation, what are the prospects for Africa? According to most international analysts, Africa will continue its growth path around 5-6% per year. The interesting thing is that this, contrary to what happened in the past, applies to all categories of countries, including even the failed states. Now, this should be put in perspective. First, this is not enough to reduce poverty. We need higher rates of growth. Higher rates of growth are needed. Second, we are starting from a low base at 5% especially as far as smaller countries are concerned, is not significant in terms of per capita income growth. Third, as we said before, distributional problems affect the continent and more is to be done to make growth more inclusive. Without pretending on any way to give lessons, I wish to make some observations and suggestions in order effectively to reach these higher levels and to have more sustainability in terms of development of the continent. According to demographic projections, Africa could see its population double to 2 billion by 2030. It's the only continent which is going to grow as, as, as fast and as big. And even quadruple to 4 billion by the end of the century. These are demographic projections done by the specialists, uh, notably the French Institute of uh, Demographics. This is indeed a good sign for future economic development, provided the continent can address all related issues. This increases in population, mostly in sub-Saharan Africa, which will be accompanied by greater urbanization will put pressure on already heavily taxed systems of education, health, and environment. Reforms of these systems and their financing should be looked at very carefully. This brings us back to the problematic of growth. Agriculture should be given top priority if higher imports of food are to be avoided and nutritional problems of the population addressed. When you are talking about food, you can imagine what, uh, what the, the problems will be. Infrastructure, including transportation, telecommunication, roads, electricity, water, sanitation, as well as infrastructure in the cities themselves, which will be much bigger, will also have to be high on the agenda. Trade and regional integration. As we said before, Africa's share of trade is 3% only in terms of world trade and intra-Africa trade is 10% only. The intra-trade should receive attention building on the successful experience in other parts of the world. To do so, there is a need for intensive, I am quoting here, uh, what uh, the UN ECA, Economic Commission for Africa, is recommending. There is a need for intensive investment in manufacturing industry that could add value to Africa's raw materials. Because now we are exporting mostly in the continent raw materials, including to emerging markets. Which also recommends, in the CAP, recommends skill development and productivity enhancement support program. Regional integration is a must. While some regions have made good progress, others like Northern Africa are regrettably missing important opportunities of additional growth in my own region. Financial systems should be modernized and more linked to international network. Here too, regional integration could help. The private sector should be developed further and practices of doing business should be improved. 
investment, including private foreign investment, should receive incentives whenever possible. Public private partnerships should be encouraged. Mr. Chairman, while this agenda is indeed very demanding and raising a number of difficulties, external observers, including international organizations, are confident that Africa is the new frontier for the future. It is now, for example, amply admitted that the better performance of Africa is not due only to commodity price moves, since we have seen for 20 years now continuation of growth despite the crisis in other parts of the world, except, as I said, during this 2009-2008 when the financial crisis hit. This being said, and if African governments succeed in their difficult task at reforming, there remain risks of external nature that could affect them. Those risks are mainly related to the evolution of growth in emerging countries that could affect African exports and to the possible tightening of the financial conditions by major nations which could make it more difficult for African countries to attract capital flows and make their financial conditions less favorable. Here we are talking about the tightening that the Fed Security conditions like in the Sahel region could also affect the performance of some African countries. Mr. Chairman, let me now turn to the relationship between Africa and Latin America. The latter is also a region, of course, you know that since uh, I'm talking here to Latin Americans, with vast natural resources and young population. Its economic performance and prospects are good. There is then even every reason to believe that those two regions of the world can develop a fruitful relationship. Bilateral trade is at levels that are not yet commensurate with this novel objective, and the strong will of governments and populations, as evidenced by the launching of the Africa South America summit process in 2006. This has elevated the relationship to a strategic level. A number of initiatives have been taken to strengthen it at all levels legal, commercial, cooperation between private sectors, chambers of commerce, etc. But quoting from a CELA report, it's an acronym, I don't know in Spanish or what it is, how it is in English or French. CELA, it's a South American. Yeah. Uh, I am quoting the. Uh, from that report that little headway has been made so far on the economic dimension and the economic cooperation is still showing low levels of activity. The report cites as a reason for this situation the, the quote, lack of information and knowledge, competitive rather than completely complementary structures, focus on third party markets. <coughs> lack of preferential conditions for mutual trade and investment relations, and barriers to transport and logistics. It is to be hoped that further work will be undertaken both at the regional level as well as at the specific country's level in order to enhance and upgrade this relationship. My own country, which has developed its relationship with a number of countries in Latin America, including, of course, Argentina, constitutes a good example in this regard. Morocco has an observer status with a number of inter-American organizations, including the Organization of American States, CEGIP, SICA, CARICOM, and Parlandino. Again, I'm sorry, yes, no, it's okay. the acronyms are perhaps in French. And regularly participates in meetings held by those organizations. Moreover, Morocco is an active participant in South America Arab states and South America Africa. Morocco can be a useful partner for Latin American countries in developing their relationship with the rest of Africa. Strong links have always existed between Morocco and its sister nations. They have been bolstered by, in the recent past, thanks to strong leadership provided by His Majesty the King Mohammed VI, who through numerous official trips and ongoing contacts with African heads of state, has succeeded in elevating those relationships to a very effective level. 
the Moroccan private sector is now very active in many parts of the continent. Major investments were made in a number of vital sectors of the African economy, banking, communications, insurance, mining, and public works. The official cooperation is also noteworthy in the fields of energy, water, irrigation, infrastructure, health, etc. Thousands of African students have been admitted with scholarships to Moroccan universities, and the Moroccan career where the Maroc has developed a big network of flights to a number of African countries. And may I say that recently with the Ebola crisis, the Royal Air Maroc is the only airline still flying to Liberia, uh, Sierra Leone, and Guinea, in spite of the all the other airlines uh, stopped uh, in, uh, in travel there. And this, of course, is helping all the organizations that are coming to help the countries because they have no way to go to the Royal Air Maroc was not uh, active. Well, Morocco has also opened a free financial center in Casablanca uh, called Casablanca Finance City, which was devised to be a hub for the continent. Lately, the African Development Bank, uh, very recently, uh, two weeks ago, decided to establish in that center a fund called Africa 50, which is designed to finance the much needed infrastructure in the continent. They came to Casablanca because of its attractiveness, because of the presence of banks. And I read this morning here in, uh, in Buenos Aires that this center, uh, there is uh, an international ranking of financial centers. Uh, this center was ranked 72nd uh, up to now. It has jumped to 51. <coughs> and it's the second only to, to South Africa, in Africa, and has gone beyond many countries, including curiously Spain. So this gives you an idea of, of, the, of the, the, the attractiveness of this. Well, there is something which is not in my uh, written statement that I talked about this morning with uh, your colleagues. It is also the port of Tangier. We have a container uh, port which is now very big, which is ranked also 50. Uh, 50. Very recently, it jumped away from it was 75 or something, it jumped to 51 developing very fast and it's a possibility for us uh, to develop relationships because that port is a distributional port between uh, Asia, uh, Europe and America and uh, playing a big role and all the, the big names of the container uh, industry are in, uh, in, in that, uh, that port. So these two things are very important to develop perhaps uh, the relationship in, uh, for investment and also for trade. In infrastructure, I mean the uh, private sector in Argentina could play a big role. This, this fund, Africa 50 fund, by the ADB and a lot of other players that will come into it. I think the countries obviously will be members and uh, many other uh, private uh, funds and so on are interested in getting into that fund of the African development. And it's supposed to start with three billion dollars uh, to go to ten uh, quickly. And uh, it's called Africa 50 because it aims at 50 billion dollars. So trying to catalyze those resources with others because the needs of Africa in terms of industry are at least Hundred billion dollars a year. So it's a very, very big market in terms of all the aspects of infrastructure, uh, roads, uh, telecommunications, uh, dams, uh, electricity, uh, and so on. And this is a must also for Africa to develop because if we don't have good infrastructure, we well, uh, another factor that, uh, that plays in favor of Morocco is that it has concluded free trade agreements with the European Union and it is now even the only strategic partner of the uh, European Union in, in the region uh, and uh, is the closest to the membership. It cannot become member because 
we are not European, but we, we have now a status which is very close to us. It's some of their meetings, uh, they, they take part in, in the discussions in the European Union. With the USA, we have also a free trade agreement, and with a number of uh, countries in the region, Tunisia, uh, with Tunisia, with uh, Jordan, uh, with Turkey, and so on. So there, there is a lot of things to, to be done. Egypt. Taking, uh, of course, Egypt is taking advantage of, uh, of the existence of those trade agreements. Finally, the country endowed with sizable resources, particularly phosphates and agriculture, enjoys peace and stability with a well, well organized democratic system under the wise leadership of His Majesty the King of Hungary. Mr. Chairman, Your Excellency, the African Ambassador to Argentina, ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude before giving you the floor for a welcome discussion by saying that Africa is a continent which, after a difficult start, is on its way to becoming a meaningful partner in the world economy. Its laudable performance during the last 20 years under difficult circumstances and major external crisis is a testimony to its capacity to become indeed the new frontier. To do so, it needs to consolidate its hard-won hard performance on macroeconomic issues and to make its growth more inclusive. It also needs to carry on with the reforms in vital sectors like education and health, but also to promote and encourage its private sector to help enhance its competitiveness in the globalized world. It should also give more attention to regional integration. The international community, despite its own present difficulties, needs to continue supporting Africa, particularly in the fields of trade and investment, and providing official development assistance where still needed. Of course, not all countries need the DNA. Latin America, with its young population and natural resources, in its mature stage of development, can play a meaningful role by cooperating with the African continent. While this cooperation is still at the nascent stage, it should be further developed. The political initiatives taken so far, like the convening of the South America-Africa summits, should provide the necessary guidance for such a novel endeavor. Thank you very much. invitado eh, el doctor Omar Cabal a hacer preguntas en el piso. Eh, solamente quisiera decir que es una presentación magnífica, nos ha dado un pantallazo muy acabado de la situación africana.